Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Let's see what popped up in theaters this week. Oh my god, it's Fantastic Four. <sighs> All right, let's get through this. This is an awful movie in which nothing works. Not the story, not the pacing, not the dialogue, not the tone, and it commits the cardinal sin of popcorn movies. It's actually kind of boring. It doesn't fulfill the basic requirements for any superhero movie, and I harp on this a lot. They must be fun! Even the brooding Dark Knight series was engrossing and had moments of levity of, oh man, I wish I could do that. Being a member of the Fantastic Four in this movie looks like a painful, horrific ordeal, and their suffering and the surprising amount of gore. This is one comic book movie that is definitely not for kids. That makes the whole experience just grim. Grim. All right, that's it for the capsule review. Let's get in depth with this sucker. Look, I am all for this seeming new trend of taking young directors with one breakout indie project and giving them a huge budget and a bigger sandbox right away rather than let them gradually grow into studio filmmakers. You catch them while they're still rebels, while they're still hungry, and you get great popcorn flicks made by modern mavericks most of the time. I'm looking at you, Colin Trevorrow. What's up, Mark Webb? Hey, Russo Brothers, Peyton Reed. Never worked with special effects before? Who cares? Come on down! Anyway, all of these directors that I just named progressed quickly to major big budget tent poles after proving themselves with sometimes as few as one well-made indie film. And that is an amazing sign that studios are willing to take risks in the name of making better movies. That might change after Fantastic Four. Already, this film's director, Josh Trank, has lost his upcoming Star Wars directing gig. Hmm, I wonder if somebody got a hold of the Fantastic Four dailies. <laughs> when a movie goes as wrong as this one, the finger pointing is bound to follow. Now with this tweet, a few days ago, Josh Trank seems to be blaming the studio for, I don't know what, editing? Editing his otherwise great film into something that isn't very good? I'm not buying it. Studio interference or not, you have to assume that the director is on the set and he's watching the actors read the dialogue every day. And that this group of actors, which includes Miles Teller, Kate Mara, Michael B. Jordan, Jamie Bell, Toby Kebbell, all actors who have been downright brilliant in other movies, all of them took direction from someone to read all of their lines with no modulation in their voice. And it wasn't the studio, okay? I thought to myself during the first few scenes showing the characters as children, wow, they couldn't find any child actors that could emote. When I grow up, I want to be the first person to teleport himself. Even if you could build it. I've already built it. Is it next to your flying car? <laughs> I'm not working on that anymore. Reed, you're insane. Thanks. But then, once we switch to the adult actors and the plot begins in earnest, this trend continues. Every actor in every scene keeps their voice right here. No higher, no lower. Serious statements, jokes, flirtations, threats, everything. Right here. For the first half of the movie, it's like the world's biggest budgeted mumblecore movie. I don't have a clip of any of these scenes, probably because the studio knows they'd bore you to death, but I will now recreate one early scene to the best of my memory between two characters who are supposed to have romantic chemistry. And scene! Hey, hey, what are you listening to? Porter said, never heard of her. It's a band, not a person. Cool, so like, is music your thing? Yeah, I read patterns. I like patterns and science and blah, 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 patterns. Cool, I just want my work to be useful. Hey, you want to be useful? You get a chance to save the world. Is that useful enough? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, cool. And scene. 
every early scene is just like that. We're given no character quirks about these people. We're not given the chance to like them or fall in love with them like we're supposed to. We're just told facts about them, and that's supposed to be enough. I know nothing other than that Reed Richards is smart. Ben Grimm is loyal. Kate Mara is smart as well. And that Michael B. Jordan is also really, really smart. But he's also a bit of a hothead. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> hothead. Uh, he does have a quick temper, though. Anyway, once the big incident happens that causes them all to get strange and varied powers, you'd think that things would get more dynamic. But other than a handful of scenes that feel pulled out of a horror movie, the proceedings keep that mumbly, morose tone. So when it's not boring and depressing, it's creepy. And then there's the third act, which comes out of nowhere and is all just bright lights and loud noises. We're introduced to the villain, Dr. Doom, and immediately it's time to fight him to the death. J just what? We barely know anything about him, what he wants, how he means to get it, and then it's just grand finale time? Oh, and he's never seen the Fantastic Four in action, couldn't possibly know what their powers are, but instinctively knows the specific trick needed to subdue each one of them? And then more crashing and flashes of light, accompanied by very helpful narration by Reed Richards, who should have no idea what's happening because it's all unprecedented, but there he is with, oh, he's opening a gateway to the other dimension. Oh, now he's trying to jam a wedge in the space-time continuum. If we can just make a boomy thing in the vortex of the apex, we should be able to polarize the hemoglobin with enough midichlorians to weaken him so that the thing can punch him in the face. Hey Reed, nice plan. Now how do you know any of that? So to sum up, the beginning is dull, the middle is off-puttingly macabre, and the ending is lame. Oh, and speaking of sneaking a look at the dailies, something has got to explain how the very last scene of the film apes the last scene from Avengers Age of Ultron entirely from the set design, the tone, and the smash cut to credits in the middle of a line of dialogue. How did no one catch that? Or did they catch it and they just decided to leave it in? Or did they do it on purpose? I don't know. Either way, it stinks of ineptitude. I would tell you to watch both scenes side by side, but I can't recommend watching even one frame of this movie. So you'll just have to take my word for it, okay? Empty bag of popcorn. Stay away from Fantastic Four. Moving on. Well, by the looks of my calendar, the summer movie season wraps up next week, so stay tuned to this channel for reviews of the last couple popcorn flicks of the season. And please support us by clicking the button to subscribe so you'll never miss a review. Once the summer season is in the rear view, I will sum up the summer of 2015 in one big blowout episode in early September, so keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, leave your comments below and give us a click on the thumbs up icon to voice your approval. We're just getting started here at Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Flame on!